Hello, friends. Today on Storytime with Lorelei, we are reading the biography of the ingenious American inventor Leo Fender, creator of the world's most iconic electric guitars. Gizmos, Gadgets, and Guitars The Story of Leo Fender by Michael Mayen, illustrated by Stephen Saliner. Gizmos and gadgets and thingamajigs were the widgets that made Leo Fender smile. Leo loved tinkering with tools, messing with machines, and taking things apart and trying to put them back together again. Sometimes he got things right, sometimes he did not. Either way, it was all part of the fun for Leo. But Leo's parents didn't have time for fun, and as far as they were concerned, neither did Leo. There was simply too much work to be done on the family farm. Leo spent his days picking weeds, planting vegetables, and packing orange crates. At the age of seven, while washing out the bed of the delivery truck, Leo slipped and hit his right eye on a fence post. The injury was so serious, the doctor could not save his eye. The glass eye he received would hide the injury but would he still be able to see well enough to sift screws and scour schematics? Would he still be able to tinker and toy with the tiny wires? Leo knew his vision would never be the same, but he refused to think of himself as broken. Like a radio that needed fixing, Leo knew that all he had to do was find the right solution to his problem. He walked to the hardware store, bought himself a strong pair of magnifying glasses for his good eye, and was back to tinkering in no time. When Leo was 13, he visited his uncle's auto electric shop. There, he saw a radio his uncle had pieced together using spare parts. Leo loved its mismatched pieces, odd knobs and circuits and solder smell. Leo wanted to know how it worked, so he bought himself a crystal radio kit and built his own. And then it broke. He fixed it. And when his friends broke, he fixed that too. By the time Leo was in high school, he was running a small radio repair business out of his bedroom. Still, Leo's parents didn't believe he would be able to build a life out of circuit boards and solder. Always obedient, Leo listened to them. He went to junior college, got a degree in accounting, got married, got a job, and then lost it. The Great Depression was in full swing, and people were poorer than ever. Leo tried to find a new job. Unfortunately, no one needed an accountant. No one had any money to count. Leo's wife, Esther, was worried. Leo promised to fix things, Literally. After all, he'd always been good with gizmos and gadgets. With a $600 loan from the bank, Leo rented a tin shack behind a gas station and opened an electronics repair shop. The way Leo figured, there would always be broken bits and bubbles that needed fixing. It wasn't long till Leo's days were filled with busted toasters, beat up typewriters, and broken record players. And broken record players. And broken record players. 
and broken record players and broken record players. Even local musicians started bringing in their battered and bruised instruments. Western swing bands had cowboyed their way across the country and taken over the Los Angeles area with their super swinging dance songs and their slip sliding electric lap steel guitars and amplifiers. These electrified guitars and amps were still new inventions and good repairmen like Leo were hard to find. Leo studied their schematics and searched their circuits like a detective looking for clues and connections. He quickly discovered that these instruments were easy to break and hard to fix. No one seemed to be building them with musicians or repairmen in mind. Leo thought he could do better. So he started tinkering and tinkering and building his own guitars. There was just one problem. Leo wasn't a musician. He couldn't actually play a guitar. He couldn't even tune one. Leo's solution was simple. He took his test instruments to local dances and asked musicians to play them. Leo loved musicians almost as much as he loved machines. He admired their focus and dedication. He knew how hard it was to become good at something. To Leo, it was the opinion of musicians that mattered most. After the shows, Leo would go back to his shop and thinker and tinker and tweak, trying to work their ideas into his designs. Sometimes they worked, sometimes they caught fire. But no matter what, Leo was always trying to improve his designs. A year later, Leo was making 30 to 40 lap steel guitars a week and distributing them to music instruction studios across Southern California. Even better, the biggest bands in the Western Swing were starting to make music with Leo's instruments. Leo's new problem was a good one. He needed a factory. So, he built one on the corner of Santa Fe and Pomona Avenues near downtown Fullerton. But, as fantastic as his new factory was, Leo's company was in trouble. Orders were pouring in, but Leo couldn't fill them. The wood he purchased was rotting. The amplifier cabinets he'd purchased had termites, and the factory he'd put together was so crammed with clutter, nobody could get anything done. Customers were complaining to his salesman, and his salesmen were complaining to him. Leo just wanted to get back to his workshop and his widgets. He even started working at night to avoid the deck collectors who were looking for him during the day. One evening, Leo got an idea. In order to compete with the banging of the drums and the blasting of the horns, guitar players had started electrifying their old acoustic guitars. Finally, audiences could hear them. Unfortunately, so could the dogs 20 miles away. Their hollow bodies weren't designed to be played at such a loud volume, and cranking them up created an ear-piercing squeal called feedback. Leo thought he could do better, and he would have to. The two-year-old Fender Electric Instrument Company was about to go bankrupt. When the big guitar companies heard that Leo was going to make a solid body electric guitar, they laughed at him. 
they didn't think Leo knew anything about the art of making real guitars. They were right, but Leo didn't care. He wasn't interested in making guitars the old way. He wanted to make something new, a solid body electric guitar anyone could play and everyone could afford. Leo went back to talking to guitarists and watching them play. He began tinkering and toying and trying and failing and trying again. Invention, Leo had learned, was more about failure than success. Leo didn't fret. Gizmos and gadgets and now guitars were the things that made him smile. Leo found a piece of solid wood, carved a body, designed new pickups, fixed feedback, improved intonation, and then attached a neck. When he was done, Leo had a guitar unlike anything anyone had ever seen. Leo thought it was slick and sleek and styled to swing. His first version was called Esquire, his second the Broadcaster, but after learning this name was already taken, he changed it once more. This time he called it the Telecaster. Everyone else called it a toilet seat with strings, or a canoe paddle, or a snow shovel. The old guitar makers laughed. No one liked it. No one except guitarists. It was fun to play, easy to fix, and affordable. It was unlike any other guitar on the market. A new instrument with a new sound for a new type of music. Rock and roll. Once again, the orders started coming in. Slowly, Leo got his factory organized. Then suddenly, the big guitar companies were scrambling to design their own solid body electric guitars, using Leo's as a model. Leo had changed the look and sound of guitars forever. Of course, he thought he could do better, so he did. He made his next guitar easier to play and more comfortable to hold, then added a vibrato bar so that the guitarist could make slip sliding and shimmering sounds like those of a lap steel. When he was done, Leo had a guitar that dipped and dove and sang and soared into the stratosphere like a rocket ship. Leo wanted its name to soar too. He called it the Stratocaster. Everyone else called it genius. Leo never thought of his guitars and amps as finished. To him, each design was just the next step on his quest to build the ideal instrument. Sure, Leo liked his new guitar, but that never stopped him from thinkering and tinkering and trying to do better. Author's Note Leo Fender was born on August 10, 1909 in Fullerton, California and started building instruments in the 1940s. Since then, no one has influenced the sound and look of modern music more than Leo and his inventions. Today, Leo's influence can be seen and heard in every area of music and in every corner of the globe. Wherever there is a radio station or a band taking the stage, Leo and his inventions are there. As Fender expert Richard R. Smith has written, Given the role that music has played in American culture, it is not an exaggeration to say that Leo's instruments were engines of musical and social change. They bridged generations, races, cultures, and musical styles, bringing everyone in the world closer through music. 
Hello, friends. I hope you enjoyed our story today. If you did, please click like and share this book with your friends. And don't forget to look for all the other books by Storytime with Lorelei. See you next time. Bye for now.